Tuesday nights were always a blur, especially on the second Tuesday of the month when my social club, the Covington League, held its meetings from 7 p.m. onward. Emily and I typically made it back home by 5.30 at the latest, giving us just enough time to settle in. Since the club included a catered dinner, cooking wasn't on my list of worries, but Emily, my wife of four years, always had a last-minute chore or two for me before I could head out the door. The real struggle, though, was my own. According to Emily, she was three months into her pregnancy, and her hormones were giving her quite the ride. Despite her condition, she remained as mesmerizing as ever, now enhanced by the glow of impending motherhood. Tearing myself away from her, even for a short evening, was becoming harder than I liked to admit. Standing at five feet four inches, with a slender frame, light brown hair, and striking green eyes, Emily's appearance complemented mine well. But I loved her for much more than just how she looked. Her sharp humor and keen instincts kept me on my toes, though her beauty didn't hurt either. By 6.30, I needed to be out the door to make it to the meeting on time, which usually meant a rush shower, a change into slacks and a casual shirt, a quick kiss goodbye, and then the short drive to the community center. That evening seemed like it would play out the same as always. After a hasty shower, I dressed, grabbed my bag, and headed to the garage. Passing through the kitchen, I pressed a kiss to the back of Emily's neck as she washed a few dishes, offering her a reassuring squeeze. With some reluctance, I stepped away and made my way out. The urge to cancel the meeting wasn't just for her sake. I also had a project waiting in the workshop. I'd been rigging up a new baby monitor system for the nursery, estimating it would take about 30 more minutes to complete. I looked forward to the proud look on Emily's face when I finally showed her. She always lit up at my small triumphs, and I wasn't above basking in that admiration. Sliding into my car, I started it up and checked my essentials. Phone, notepad, calculator. All set. The garage door rattled open as I backed out, waving one last time through the window. Emily, hands busy, gave a brief smile before vanishing from view. Before I could shift into drive or close the garage door, my phone rang, stopping me in my tracks. Answering it, I glanced back at the window where Emily had been. Gone. The voice on the line said I'd picked up at just the right time. The club president, Mark, along with the key organizers, had been called out of town. With half the leadership absent, tonight's meeting was scrapped. Relief swept over me at having the night unexpectedly free. I reversed back into the garage, noticing Emily's face still hadn't appeared in the kitchen window. She later confessed she hadn't left, expecting to catch me off guard. If she'd been anywhere else, she wouldn't have heard my car pull in. After parking and closing the garage, I stayed seated for a moment, letting the quiet soak in. I decided to order takeout so I could put the finishing touches on the baby monitor setup without worrying about dinner. The system was almost ready. I just needed to finalize a few connections. The camera, discreetly mounted in the nursery, had gone unnoticed by Emily for almost two weeks. It had been her casual mention of needing a way to check on the baby that sparked the project. I'd even installed a secondary control setup in the garage, complete with speakers and an old TV for video feeds. This way, I could work on my hobbies while staying attentive. After about 20 minutes of adjustments, I tested the sound channels. They were responsive, and I could clearly hear the gentle sounds of Emily moving in the master bedroom. Satisfied, I connected all the rooms to feed into the garage system and checked the main video display. Then, as I flipped through the channels, a voice drifted through the living room speaker. It was Emily's, clear as day, speaking on the phone. Curious, I turned up the volume. Her voice sounded light and she said to whoever was on the line, Thanks for coming by at 7 o'clock, it means a lot. The response was muffled but unmistakable. Of course, don't worry, M. See you soon, and let's make this count. No repeats. A laugh from Emily sealed the moment before the line clicked off. My chest tightened. Who was that? The only person I could think of by that name was Roger. I knew Roger Jenkins. He was Crystal's husband. Crystal had been Emily's college roommate, and was still her best friend. Roger and I got along fine. He was an easygoing guy. I guessed he and Emily were planning something for Crystal. Well, I'd find out soon enough. It was only 15 minutes until 7 o'clock. Pushing aside my speculation, 
I turned on the camera in the baby's room and leaned back, pleased with myself. The monitor displayed the spare bedroom, where the camera focused on the neatly made queen-size bed, sheets turned down. It was unusual. Emily only did this when expecting company. Adjusting the controls, I zoomed in and out. At the widest zoom, the room was fully visible except for the corner where the camera was mounted. Satisfied with the view, I set the controls and glanced at the clear image showing the door, window, closet, and well-made bed. Feeling pleased with my project, I tidied my workbench and grabbed a beer from the old fridge. I settled into my $150 recliner my garage staple that Emily wouldn't allow in the house. Just as I contemplated ordering pizza and surprising Emily, the front doorbell interrupted my thoughts. A moment later, I heard Emily greet the visitor, her voice tinged with excitement. Come in, Roger, she said, sounding impatient. We only have until 10.30, she added. Until then, I'm all yours. The shock came not from her words, but from the husky tone I knew so well. I almost choked on my last sip of beer as I sat up abruptly. The front door clicked shut, and I heard Emily again, laughing lightly and saying, Judging by the look on your face, I'm not the only one eager. Roger responded, followed by sounds that made my stomach drop. Emily then said, Not here. Let's go to the bedroom. I set everything up. It couldn't be what it sounded like. Emily and I were deeply in love. We were expecting a child and she had always been faithful, as far as I knew. She would tease me about noticing other women, but it was just harmless talk. I never had the desire to stray, and our intimate life was good. We were happy. This had to be some misunderstanding. I glanced at the monitor, my heart pounding. The door to the spare room opened, and Emily guided Roger inside. She positioned him between the bed and the window. While she stepped back in front of the closet doors, facing him and almost staring directly into the camera. She was wearing her worn-out robe, the one she usually lounged in on Saturday mornings. Her hair was styled in a bun, and she wore the high-heeled slippers I'd given her two months ago. I hadn't seen them outside her closet since her birthday. Emily's hands rose to the robe's neckline. She held it closed with one hand as she undid the buttons with the other. When she opened it, I realized she was wearing the lingerie I'd given her for Valentine's Day. She hadn't worn it since that night. Keeping eye contact with Roger, she shrugged the robe off her shoulders, letting it fall to the floor. Roger's eyes widened as he muttered, I didn't expect this. You look incredible, Emily. I sat in stunned silence, realizing I needed proof. Shaking, I moved into the dark living room and grabbed a new SD card to capture what was happening. I returned to the garage inserted the fresh SD card into the monitor, and switched everything back on. The screen flickered to life, showing Roger and Emily as tears blurred my vision. They moved to the bed and embraced tightly, engaging in an act that felt like it stretched on forever, with Roger pushing relentlessly into her. After about 15 minutes, I saw Emily try to pull away. Watching this unfold on the monitor, I stood and began pacing the garage, battling a wave of nausea and indecision. I knew if I went inside at that moment, it could lead to violence. Roger, unless you want Gary walking in on us, you need to go now, Emily said. She bent down, gathered his clothes, and handed them to him. Scooping up the remnants of the lingerie, she placed everything on the dresser. Emily then threw on her old robe and stripped the sheets off the bed not even waiting for Roger to finish dressing before bundling them up and heading to the washer in the laundry room between the kitchen and garage. When she returned to the living room, Roger was there, adopting that boastful, satisfied tone men use. He said it had been great and suggested they talk about doing it again sometime. Emily's voice was firm as she reminded him, I meant it when I said just this once, and only because of our agreement. Roger acknowledged her, chuckling lightly. Yeah. Just the once, he said, adding, but if you ever think about how good it was, maybe we can try again. I heard another sloppy kiss before Roger's footsteps faded toward the door. Emily's voice held a hint of urgency, accompanied by small, nervous sounds. I didn't process them at the time, nor the relieved sigh she made as she followed him to the door. I lay back in the ratty recliner, staring at the now-empty room on the monitor. Glancing at my watch, I noted the time. 10.37. They had kept perfectly to their schedule. 
I heard Roger murmur something at the door and Emily's clear reply. It was just this one time, because of our old agreement. You know Gary is my husband, my lover, the man I want in my life. Her voice wavered as she added, I don't even know why we did this now. Crystal's my best friend, and she matters more than any affair. She asked Roger what Crystal meant to him. Though I couldn't make out his mumbled response, I heard one last kiss and the quiet sound of the door closing and locking. If not for the tears clouding my eyes and the despair gnawing at me, the exhaustion in Roger's voice might have seemed absurdly comical. But there was nothing funny about it then. Emily reappeared in the spare room, now a haunting reminder instead of the baby's room. She checked the space meticulously, making sure nothing seemed out of place after what had transpired. Gathering her clothes, she vanished down the hallway, and I soon heard the water running in our bedroom's bathroom. The sound of the shower brought a hollow ache to my chest. Moments later, I heard the bed creak as Emily settled in, the room now silent. I glanced at the time, nearly eleven o'clock. I sat there, lost in thought and overwhelmed by heartbreak. My mind spun with questions and half-formed ideas, some that tried to excuse her actions, others that countered those excuses, and still others that asked what I could have done to push her to this point. After midnight, drained and numb. I finally turned off the electronics and made my way inside. I passed the spare room, a hollow reminder of what had happened, and saw that everything was just as I'd last left it Monday evening. The bed was stripped bare. Nothing looked amiss. Groaning, I stepped into the master bedroom. Emily lay sleeping, or at least pretending to. I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, and stripped off my clothes, dropping them into the empty hamper. There was no trace of the lingerie. Sliding into bed, Emily rolled over and draped an arm across me, her voice drowsy as she asked, How was your night? After a pause, I replied, It was traumatic. I'll tell you later. Usually, she would snuggle close. But tonight she withdrew her arm, turned her back to me, and lay still. Listening to her breathing, I felt certain she was still awake. I turned over as well, staring into the darkness. Sleep didn't come easily that night. I couldn't remember if I'd actually slept at all when the alarm finally went off. I just lay there, feeling drained and in no shape to go to work. I told Emily I thought I had the flu and stayed in bed until I heard her car pull out of the driveway. Once she was gone, I got up and carefully opened her dresser drawers, ensuring nothing looked disturbed. In the bottom drawer, under some sweaters, I found the lingerie she had worn with Roger neatly folded in a paper bag. The lap of the underwear was still damp. After calling in sick to my boss, I played back the video from the night before. I fast-forwarded through most of it at first, not wanting to relive the details, just confirming the tape's quality. As the minutes passed, though, I began noticing things I had initially missed. The morning turned into hours spent examining the footage closely. I made two copies and placed a couple of phone calls. By the time I was done, I realized I hadn't eaten anything since lunch the previous day. Skipping breakfast felt natural given the churn in my stomach. Emily returned home at her usual time around 4.30. When she leaned in to kiss me, I turned away, and she gave me a puzzled look. By 5.30, I knew I couldn't put it off any longer. I had to confront her. Emily, do you have a minute to see what I've been working on for the baby monitor? I asked. She replied that we should wait until after dinner since she was just getting ready to start it. Picking up my phone, I asked her what she wanted for dinner. She suggested Chinese, and I ordered it for delivery. Once the food was on its way, I led her into the bedroom to show her the control panel behind the door. I left the sound feature on and walked between rooms, talking to her through the system. Though she couldn't respond, her smile when I came back told me it was working better than expected. I then turned on the video monitor and told her to watch for a moment. Stepping into the spare room, I stood where she had stood the night before, forcing myself to mimic a silly dance before returning to our room. Gary, this is amazing. When did you finish it? She asked with a smile that hinted at confusion. This afternoon, I said, pausing for effect. Actually, it's been ready since last night. Her smile wavered as she tried to piece it together. There's one more thing to show you, I said taking her hand and guiding her to the garage. Since I spend a lot of time here, I thought it made sense to set up a monitoring station for when you're out. 
I activated the garage setup and added, let me show you how it works. I inserted a USB drive into the old TV and told her to watch. The monitor showed the same view from the bedroom, beginning with an empty room and an unmade bed. With the remote, I played the video. The image changed to show Emily on her knees in front of Roger. I glanced at her and saw the color drain from her face as she swayed, catching herself for balance. Her eyes met mine, wide with shock, as I pressed fast forward for a few seconds before pausing the video again. Watch, I said, my voice flat. On the screen, Roger grabbed at her underwear, and though there was no sound, we both saw Emily's mouth move, saying something. A small scream followed, one I now recognized as pained. Tears streamed down her face, and she cringed at the sight of Roger's rough movements. I stopped the video. Do you want to see more? I asked. Emily looked at me helplessly, tears streaking her face. I motioned for her to follow me back inside. We moved into the kitchen, where I guided her to a chair and sat down at the end of the table. Through her sobs, she mumbled, I can explain. I need an explanation, I said. What was the promise you made Roger back in college? How long ago did you promise yourself to him? She began haltingly. It wasn't what you think. Roger and I were dating back then. He had a reputation, sure. But when I started rooming with Crystal, he was seeing both of us. She described how Roger and Crystal eventually became more serious. Then she recounted one night in her room when they drank and talked candidly. She told Roger the only reason she hadn't slept with him was her fear of pregnancy. Roger, known for expecting his partners to be on the pill, had pushed the topic, and they argued. Emily continued, I wrote a note that night. A promise that if I could be sure I wouldn't get pregnant, I would spend a night with him. She paused, glancing at me to gauge my reaction. I stared at her in disbelief. How long ago was this? I asked. About six years, Emily answered, her voice trembling. She continued, explaining that the note had been more of an inside joke between her and Roger ever since. When we told Roger and Lisa about the pregnancy two weeks ago, everyone was thrilled. But after the initial congratulations, Roger and I had gone into their garage to check out an issue he was having. Once I was out of sight, Lisa had turned to Emily and reminded her that the promissory note was now due. Emily was shocked that Lisa even knew about it, and even more stunned to realize that Lisa was serious. When Roger and I came back, I remembered a case of imported beer I had promised to bring for the cookout. Insisting it would only take a few minutes, I left to pick it up, leaving the other three behind. While I was gone, Lisa brought up the note again. Emily was surprised to find that Roger also believed the note should be honored. He was indignant when he heard she was thinking of backing out. This was after three solid hours of drinking, the last Emily would have until after breastfeeding. Before I returned, they had agreed. Emily would follow through on the old note. I told Emily that her story was one of the strangest things I'd ever heard and hard for me to wrap my head around. I asked, who's the father of the baby you're carrying? Emily shrank at the question, tears spilling down her cheeks again. My next question was sharper. How many other promises like this have you made? And how many have you kept? Emily screamed at me. There aren't any. None. I love you, Gary. She pleaded, repeating that it was a one-time thing and would never happen again. She begged me to hear her out, acknowledging that it all might sound absurd but insisted on explaining. Emily stressed that it wasn't planned or wanted and that she had never been unfaithful before. She dropped to her knees, covering her face in tears. I took a deep breath. Can I ask you some questions? I said, my voice taut. Emily nodded, urging me to go ahead, saying she'd answer anything. She repeated that it was just once, not something she wanted, and admitted that even to her, it now seemed unbelievable. You're worth more to me than anything, she whispered. Looking at her on the floor, my chest tightened with both pain and confusion. This was my best friend, my partner for life. But now I had to know who she really was. Could you have said no to this? I asked. She paused before replying, yes, I could have. But I felt my honor was at stake. Emily explained she hadn't told me because she feared I wouldn't understand. If you were in my position, she said quietly, I thought you might have done the same thing. She admitted that when the note was made, she was drunk. 
but even after sobering up, she never discarded it. It wasn't about cheating on me. It was a promise she'd made to someone who had once been dear to her. I processed her words, then said, So, even after sobering up, you felt you owed it to him. Is that correct? Emily nodded solemnly. I pressed on. Think carefully. Was this something you were looking forward to? Emily took a deep breath. No, she said. At first, I thought it was just a joke. But eventually, I realized it wasn't. I kept my gaze locked on hers. In the past two weeks, did you anticipate it? She swallowed hard. Not in the way you might think, she answered, voice breaking. I felt obligated, not excited. Emily then whispered, Okay, yes Gary. I guess part of me wanted to get through it, and if I had to, I figured I might as well make it bearable. But it was never about you not being enough. It was about honoring something I never thought would come up again. I sighed, remembering something. Six weeks ago, when I called you from the road after that conference, we joked a bit. I suggested meeting at the Holiday Inn in Atherton for a weekend away. Do you remember? A small, tremulous smile formed on her lips. Yes, it was a great weekend, she said. Did you want that to be a special weekend for us? I asked. Of course I did, Emily replied, her smile turning genuine. And it was. I followed up. Do you remember what you packed for that weekend? Emily's eyes softened. I packed a nice dress for dancing, which we did, and some comfortable clothes for walking. I need you to wait a minute, I said to Emily, explaining that I needed to show her something on the video to help her understand my next question. I turned and walked toward our bedroom, glancing back halfway down the hall to make sure she was following. She was, her steps hesitant but steady. I powered up the bedroom TV and pressed play on the remote. The scene started. Emily, still kneeling before Roger, then rising and turning to the bed, facing the hidden camera. What were you wearing? I asked, my voice low. Emily blushed deeply. The white lingerie set from Valentine's Day, she admitted, adding, I never wore it for you except when I first modeled it after you gave it to me. She paused, looking confused. There just hadn't been an occasion, she murmured. I reminded her that during our weekend getaway at the Holiday Inn, she didn't wear it. Instead, she changed into a simple peasant skirt and white blouse, with plain cotton underwear and a bra, probably the same kind she wore now. I asked if she remembered what she had worn to bed that night. In a small voice, she replied, my Donald Duck t-shirt. Looking straight into her eyes, I said, you told me that weekend was special, and the night with Roger wasn't. Yet, you wore one of the nicest things you owned for him, something I bought for us. Not for me, but for him. Emily's shoulders slumped as she met my gaze, a mixture of shame and sorrow in her eyes. I continued, if I didn't love you, we wouldn't be in this house together. If you weren't special to me, we wouldn't be married. I recounted how an unexpected call had canceled my meeting the night before, plunging me into one of the worst experiences I could imagine. Roger, one of my closest friends, showed up when I should have been away. Emily, my wife, greeted him at the door and led him to a room she had carefully prepared, giving him a show and wearing clothes she hadn't worn for me in over a year. When I asked why, she claimed the meeting hadn't meant anything to her. But she'd gone to great lengths, dressing up, doing her hair, applying makeup she hadn't put on for me in ages. To me, that effort suggested that her time with Roger was significant, a treat she prepared for, while time with me was ordinary and less valued. I had seen her doing things for Roger that she only did for me on rare, special occasions, if at all, and some things she had outright refused to do for me. Tears filled Emily's eyes, and she blinked them away, insisting, it wasn't like that. I love you. You mean everything to me. I sat on the bed, exhaustion weighing me down. I'm not sure what steps we can take from here, I said, adding that I intended to call Roger and Lisa and ask them to come over that evening. I asked Emily if Lisa knew about everything. Then, I picked up the phone and dialed their number. Lisa answered, and I requested that they come by for a brief talk that evening. While I was on the call, Emily went to the door to handle the Chinese food delivery. Despite my lack of appetite, I forced myself to eat, knowing a long, emotional night was ahead. Emily picked at her food, and for a moment, I almost believed her when she said it was a one-time mistake and that she still loved me. 
Around 7.15, the doorbell rang. Before opening it, I turned to Emily and said, I have a feeling there's more to this than you think. I welcomed Roger and Lisa inside. Both smiled at me, but I noticed a subtle exchange of glances between them and Emily. Roger's gaze lingered on her with a possessiveness that made Emily flinch. As we settled into the living room, I motioned for Emily to sit on the couch beside Lisa. She hesitated, choosing her recliner off to the side instead. I rambled on about a few topics, mentioning the new monitoring system I'd been working on but withholding what I had discovered the night before. Roger and Lisa exchanged puzzled looks, questioning why they had been called over. I broached the topic, trying to ease into it by offering drinks to lighten the mood. Everyone accepted, so I served their preferred beverages. Crystal's white wine, Roger's Jack Daniels and 7-Up, Emily's orange juice due to her pregnancy, and what appeared to be my gin and tonic but was just tonic water. I took a seat on a stool near the TV, needing to maintain my composure while observing the room. I finally turned to Crystal. What was your motivation for setting this all up? I asked. She looked puzzled, tilting her head. What do you mean? She asked. I clarified. Why did you put so much effort into arranging everything? As I finished, Roger sputtered and choked on his drink. I turned my attention to him, noting that while I understood what he got out of it, I wondered if there was more to the story. Switching my gaze between the women, I finally addressed Roger. Your reputation as a playboy doesn't exactly make this surprising, but was it really worth the risk? He fumbled for words, claiming he'd been home the night before when the meeting was canceled. He mentioned being in the garage when I was supposed to be at my club meeting. To back himself up, he gestured toward the monitor, which was now showing the live feed from the spare room. The quality of the picture stood out, and I made a comment about its clarity, emphasizing the timing of when it was installed. Emily sat with her face buried in her hands, while Roger's face turned pale. Crystal, however, kept a sly smile as she crossed her legs, her foot bouncing nervously. So what's the point of all this? I continued, my eyes locking with hers. Crystal responded, What do you think it all means? I mentioned the murmurs I'd heard at the Covington Club meetings about Crystal's and Roger's reputations, and noted that while they had been direct with us, I had overheard comments from others. I admitted I was relieved they hadn't said anything to us yet, but figured that was about to change. Crystal sighed, acknowledging that this wasn't the best way to bring it up, but agreed it was time to come clean. I glanced at Emily, who looked bewildered. Up until that moment, I thought she might have been aware of this, but her expression told me otherwise. Crystal began explaining that she and Roger had been involved in a key club for a couple of years. On Friday nights, Members met at a local place called Barney's Broiler, where couples would have dinner in a private room. Each couple would bring a house key marked with their address, dropping it into a barrel like a bingo drum. After dinner, the wives would go home to prepare for an evening with a different partner. Meanwhile, the husbands would draw a key from the barrel. If a man drew his own address, he'd hold it in his left hand, draw another, and put his own key back. Some guys would draw again if they weren't happy with the first address but they could only draw twice. If they pulled their wife's key the second time, they were out of luck. After the draw, the men would have a drink and head out for a weekend rendezvous, not just for a night, but the entire weekend. Crystal and Roger's closeness to us had led others to believe we might be participating, and many of the men had shown interest in Emily, not just Roger. The room fell silent as I finished laying out the details. Emily's mouth hung open, shock evident on her face. Crystal's smile turned coy, her foot still bouncing, while Roger looked smug and slightly relieved. Before we go any further, Emily, there's something you need to know about your partner from last night, I said, watching her face pale again. I recounted what I knew, noting that she didn't want to be reminded of our fragile marriage state. Roger's reputation as the prize at these events is well known, I added, and Emily's face flushed a deep red. She buried her face in her hands peeking once at Roger, who wore an irritatingly wide grin. Feeling the need to address his condescending smirk, I explained that Roger was highly sought after during the key club draws, with wives hoping for a chance to be with him. And now, Emily, you've experienced what they all wanted, I said, looking from her to Roger, who was still smirking. Crystal was also watching Emily with a knowing look, 
while Emily seemed to sink deeper into her chair. I leaned back on the stool and took a long drink of my tonic, its bitterness mirroring the taste in my mouth. Silence filled the room as I let the tension grow. Roger looked pleased, but Crystal appeared like she had something to add. Finally, she spoke, saying their arrangement had been a way to add excitement to their marriage, preventing things from becoming stale. According to her, it could bring a spark to a relationship and make couples feel closer. Roger's grin widened in agreement. Crystal continued, expressing that she believed their arrangement wouldn't affect our friendship and could even inspire new ideas for our own bedroom. She assured us there was no pressure, encouraging us to think it over and reminding us that they would be there whenever we made up our minds. Listening to her, I acknowledged Crystal's patience but firmly stated that I hadn't discussed any of this with Emily and had no intention of doing so. I expressed that I had no interest in swapping partners or seeking intimacy outside of my marriage. I emphasized that Emily and I were intelligent, well-read, and creative enough that we didn't need unconventional methods to enrich our relationship. I expressed my hope that we would continue to enjoy life together for many years. My tone shifted as I brought up a more serious matter, the fact that Roger hadn't practiced safe intimacy. This was a significant concern given that Emily was now pregnant with our child. I explained that she would need to see a doctor to be tested for any STDs, adding that we couldn't be intimate until the results came back clear. I needed Emily to understand the severity of this situation. Turning to Roger and Crystal, I voiced my deep sense of betrayal, unsure which of them had disappointed me more. I told them that, for the time being, we wouldn't be having any more social gatherings. Powering off the TV, I ejected the USB drive and handed it to Emily. With trembling hands, she crumpled up sheets of that day's unopened newspaper, lit a match, and set them ablaze in the fireplace. She placed the drive on top, and we stood together, watching as it was reduced to ashes. When I turned back, I noticed that Roger and Crystal were unconscious. The sedative worked, I muttered before picking up the phone and calling Lopez. Three hours later, at 11 p.m., the doorbell rang. Lopez stepped in, his eyes scanning the room, and I pointed to the two unmoving bodies. The package is ready, I said. Lopez nodded and asked if I had anything for him. I gestured toward Roger and Crystal. Lopez stepped outside and returned with a group of seven men. They lifted Crystal first, but as they approached Roger, I raised a hand. Wait, I said, heading upstairs to grab a baseball bat. Standing over Roger, I explained that I had a few things to address, kneecaps, ankles, and a couple of other places, with a few quick strikes. Lopez nodded, and Roger was placed on the floor. Though unconscious, I struck where I needed to, my face expressionless as I worked. Emily watched, her mouth open in shock. I wish he could scream, I said, though I knew he couldn't. The group then carried him out, and Lopez returned to sit with me for a moment. He thanked me for the samples, to which I replied, my pleasure. Emily remained seated, stunned into silence. After Lopez and his team left, the cold night air settled around us. Emily finally turned to me, her voice unsteady. What will happen to them? She asked. They're going to Mexico, I said flatly, to help medical students practice. Her eyes widened. And if someone looks for them? Lopez will handle it, I replied, my voice cold. I told her she might as well forget them, adding that I had ensured they'd serve a purpose in society. Emily's face crumpled, visibly shaken. I then told her that my earlier promise about us returning to normal was a lie. The next morning, we would conduct a DNA test to determine if I was the father of the baby. If the results confirmed it, I would support her through the birth, but our marriage would not continue. She wouldn't be allowed any new relationships until our son turned 10. If she did, there would be consequences. We'll file for divorce, I said, and you'll keep the house. I'll provide financial support until you find work. Emily nodded, still processing the shock of my words. I didn't know this side of you, she whispered. Neither did I, I said as I walked away. The following day, we filed for divorce. Three weeks later, the DNA report confirmed I was the father. Months passed, and when my son was born, I dedicated myself to being there for him, maintaining minimal contact with Emily. Although I continued to support her financially, my love for her had died that night. 
True to our agreement, she didn't pursue any relationships, and I didn't date either, pouring my energy into raising our son. Lopez expressed his gratitude with a substantial thank you gift, and no one came looking for Roger and Crystal.